Good morning uh, to everyone who's here in person and thank you to those of you who are joining us online. Um, my name is David, Reverend David Quirk Thornton, and I'm here from London. It's absolutely wonderful to be back at the Jodo Shinchi Center. I uh, have many, many fond memories of being here, uh, preparing for Takudo, preparing for ordination, uh, uh, almost five years ago, um, and uh, how, how time flies. Um, just before we, we started, we had service and we chanted Yusege, and then uh, Reverend Hirano did a, a brief welcome and introduction to people, and he said in that introduction that when he, he met me, he thought I worked for MI5. Um, but of course, even if I did, I couldn't say. Um, and then he went on to say, when he heard me speak, he wanted to have a martini with me. And I can confirm we had a martini in, in London. In fact, we, we had several. Uh, I have a photo to prove it, Hirano uh, Sensei. Um, it really is so nice to be back here after what have been the strangest of years, um, last few years. And uh, I very much regard Jyoro Shinshu and Sangha as family. Sometimes we refer to each other as Dharma friends, and I don't think that captures it. It doesn't capture it enough for me. When I go home to my family home in Dublin and visit, I wake up early in the morning and the person I bump into early in the morning is my mum cooking in the kitchen. She's always up before everyone else and she's lovingly preparing a fantastic breakfast. When I got up early this morning, I saw Bishop and Judy and Michael in the kitchen preparing breakfast. Oh. Half past six this morning. Um, They're in the, in the kitchen preparing breakfast. And it really reminded me of just like being at home. You know, the extra mile that people go to, not just for friends, but for, for family. And I often refer to um, Sangha as brother and sister. And sometimes when I'm speaking publicly, I'll say, good morning, brothers and sisters. And people think this guy is still a Catholic priest. You know, he's referring to like, you know, they call me father and I call them brothers and sisters. And I'm not, I've, you know, completely transitioned over. So when I'm calling people Dharma brothers and Dharma sisters, for me, that's because I regard Sangha as family. And when I was met at the airport, I flew into San Francisco uh, and uh, Reverend Jerry and Reverend Carmela met me. I fly a lot and I travel a lot and I meet up with friends. It really felt different meeting Reverend Jerry and Reverend Carmela again. It was like meeting family. And when I saw Reverend Kuhara yesterday, I was filled with immense gratitude. All that he has done for us, all that he has done for all of us, all over the world, actually, the most hardworking man I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And again, I could really feel that gratitude. And when I saw Reverend Landon, when I arrived, it really was a reconnection with a Dharma brother. And I'm sure it'll be the same again with Reverend Melissa later, because we did talk it up together. We went to Japan and did boot camp together. <laughs> and when you do boot camp, you really do connect. Now you might think, oh my goodness, this guy's a really soppy guy. Oh, there's emotion coming out. And it's not just because I'm in California and I'm sharing. Um, I'm not a soppy guy at all. In fact, I'm really tough, really, really tough. I smile a lot. That's my natural face. I'm smiling all the time. Uh, sometimes I've been called a smiling assassin. So I guess I, I, guess I need to think about that. Um, but really, I'm not a soppy person. And I will share with you, because I'm amongst friends, that in my family, my family tease me because I never cry. Even as a boy, I never cried. And when I lost loved ones, I didn't cry. And so I was speaking to colleagues in my professional role because I work with a lot of, you know, kind of eminent colleagues who are 
doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists. And they would speak to me about this and say, you know, what are you doing? Are you bottling it all up? And I said, no, I don't bottle it up at all. Really, I learned early on that I'm an empath. And so what you feel, I feel. I learned that very, very early on. So the reason why I don't cry is because if I start, I will never stop. <laughs> really, I will never stop. And the teacher once said to me, you know, if you want to be of benefit to people, if you want to help people, you can't just sit on the floor with them sobbing. You have to be there to give them a hand up. So religion, particularly Jodo Shinshu, has really helped me to process what I feel. And there's a, a technique I learned many years ago that when you are breathing in toxic air, and some of the issues that come across my desk in my day job are very toxic, very shocking, very, very difficult and very sad. That when you are connecting with people, you breathe out light. You feel what you're taking in because you want to connect with people. But when you are engaging with them, you breathe out light. And for me, that helps me process, let it out, process, in a way that I think for many people, crying, crying really helps. But I learned this early on, and I, I guess, you know, maybe someday I will cry, but if I do, stay clear, um, <laughs> because I will need lots of tissues. Um, and I, I, I shared it with you because, as I say, I'm, I'm really quite a tough guy. But the emotion I feel, the love I feel when I'm among Sangha is absolutely immense. And that's what tells me I'm home. Now, Shinran Shonen says in the hymns of the Pure Land, the light of compassion illumines us from afar. Those beings it reaches, it is taught, attain the joy of Dharma. So take refuge in Amida, the great consolation. And I share that with you because sometimes people outside Buddhism think we're kind of um, a little bit obsessed with death and what happens after death. So how can we go through life thinking about death and what happens after death? Doesn't that make us depressed? Doesn't that make us sad? And it's the complete opposite. It's the complete opposite because the joy of Dharma is not like an ordinary joy. When we fall in love, when we get married, maybe when we have kids, and something wonderful happens in our lives, that is certainly joy. But the joy of Dharma is a different joy. It's the joy of being assured that we are held. And sometimes, people refer to this as having a settled mind. In the West, when we talk about the mind, we think about up here. But of course, in the East, when people talk about the mind, they talk about here, the heart. So perhaps it's more appropriate to say a settled heart. And when we have a settled heart, we can encounter any experience in our lives. We can feel it. We can be shaken by it, but we can find steady ground underfoot again. And that's because of the assurance that we feel in our hearts that we know we are held. We know we are held, and at the end of this life, we go to the pure land. And I think that gives us a confidence and a resilience in Jodo Shinshu. Not an arrogance. Not a laissez-faire approach to life. It doesn't matter what I do. I can do anything and this is just going to happen. As Shinran said, just because there's a, um, this assurance, we, we don't drink the, the poison because there's an antidote. So, of course, we have responsibilities. But that fundamental assurance is the source of our joy, is what helps us encounter life's experiences, and still get up, find steady ground underfoot again, and say, Namo Amida Butsa, and to remember, 
and find our compass north, north again. So I want to share a little bit about my uh, spiritual journey. Um, and I'm sharing it not just because it's a story I like to tell, I'm sharing it because I hope you will find yourself somewhere on that journey too. So from an early age, um, I was what you might call a kind of spiritual person. Um, I had a very, very happy childhood. I grew up in Dublin in Ireland. And Ireland really is as wonderful as you see in the movies. <laughs> had a very happy childhood, very big family, very big family network around me and incredible characters. Um, I think the Irish are probably the funniest people on the planet. <laughs> because not only do other people laugh at us, but we laugh at ourselves all the time, all the time. And uh, in my family, we had many, many wonderful characters. Um, my grandfather on my mother's side and my grandmother on my father's side. She didn't know she was funny. That's what made her funny. <laughs> she, she, was, she was like the queen. She would always carry a handbag and have dogs around her and wear gloves. So it was very formal to go and see her. But she was hilariously funny. <laughs> she just played it straight. Whereas my grandfather was warm and charismatic and always telling jokes and always teasing. But the skill in his teasing was you never felt embarrassed. You never felt humiliated. You felt like he saw you, he knew you and would just connect with you. So I had this wonderful family around me and parents and siblings, but I was quite a serious boy. So from about age 15, I was banging on the monastery door saying, please let me in. I wanted to work with people. I wanted to help people. And I was very struck actually by the story of Steve Biko in South Africa. I read an account of his life by Donald Wood, and I was really struck by his power and the efforts he made to, to help people. He was a, an activist in apartheid South Africa, and he saw that the way to liberation was education. And black children in South Africa were not being educated at that time. Segregation was really serious segregation. And he wanted to support people, encourage them to get into ed education. And of course he paid for his activism with his life. He was murdered. But Donald Wood wrote um, the story about him. The film was made called Biko. And I read this and, and uh, later saw the film. And I was really struck by him and his mission. And uh, so I thought, well, what would be my contribution? Will I be a teacher? Will I be a doctor? Um, I thought, well, go and be, go and be a priest. And there were no priests in my family. My family were not a very religious family. Um, they went to mass every Sunday, but they didn't expect any of us to become a priest. In fact, they didn't want me to become a priest. <laughs> they asked me not to become a priest. <laughs> and um, they said I could you know, do all sorts of other things, help people in different ways. I didn't have to become a priest. And I really wanted to become a priest because I felt I just couldn't help people in a kind of human way, a human welfare way, um, I wanted to connect with my empathic nature and make sense of it in a bigger way. I thought there has to be a deeper meaning to this. I can't just learn a model of psychology. I can't just learn a practice as a teacher. There has to be something deeper than this. So I was banging on the monastery door from age 15 and they said, no, 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 we can't let you in. You're too young. Go finish your education. So I did go finish my education. I finished it quite early. I finished school at 17. And then I went back and said, now I finished my education. You have to let me in. And, uh, and they did. So age 17, I joined the Franciscan order and um, became a friar. And the Franciscans were a wonderful order, are a wonderful order. 
they embrace poverty as one of the three vows they take. So they live together in a friary or a monastery and they live in brotherhood and poverty is kind of the guiding, guiding principle. And they were so humble and so warm. They made space for playfulness and humor. You can imagine 20, 30 men living together um, in, in one place, living the religious life. But there was this camaraderie at a very deep level where we would call each other frati, brothers, and, um, and we would uh, tease each other. And, and it was very, 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 very playful. And um, I don't really do play. And uh, so I kind of had to learn how to do play. But I credit the Franciscans for helping me transition from boy to man and not to take myself so seriously. So I was like a serious student. I would catch teachers at the seminary on uh, issues and then want to debate that kind of full on. And they didn't really like that, um, actually. They just wanted me to learn what was in the book so I could repeat it. There was no real interest in, in, in debate. And I can remember one occasion when we were talking about the nature of God and that we were all made in the image of God. So I put my hand up and said, you know, does that mean God's a woman as well as a man? And his teacher looked at me and he was a Carmelite. So he had a, a scapular down the front of his habit and he flung it over his shoulder. And he said, um, Ratzinger, then the head of the School of Doctrine who went on to become the Pope, he said, Ratzinger would have your ass for that. <laughs> That's like heresy. And I'm like, I don't get that. You just said we're all made in the image of God. So surely God's a man and a woman and beyond gender. And he said, do you mean to tell me God's a little old lady with a bun on her head? <laughs> and I said, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. So he said, go home tomorrow. You give a lecture on the femininity of God. So I went straight back to the monastery, stayed up all night in the library and gave the lecture of my life on the femininity of God the next day. But there was a tension building. You know, I was hearing from the book, here is the teaching of the Catholic Church. And I was questioning and challenging because I needed to believe it. And if I couldn't believe it, I couldn't live it. And I certainly couldn't teach it. So I had this tremendous support network of brothers around me and um, and I really loved them. I really loved that support and that spiritual journey together. But the more I studied Christianity and Catholicism in particular, the more I realized I was not a Christian and I was not a Catholic. And then the more I was administering, I discovered it didn't make any sense to me at all. And I want to share some examples. I've shared some before, and I won't repeat them, but if anyone wants to hear about the kidnapping of baby Jesus from the crib, I will happily recount that story over a cup of coffee during break. But I've shared that before. And there's so many stories, I have some new ones for you today. <laughs> so one of the most solemn services in Catholicism is benediction. Have any of you heard of benediction? So benediction is, is a beautiful service. It starts with some singing, lots of incense, lots of incense. And then the priest goes to the tabernacle, which is where the Eucharist is kept, the body of Christ is kept. And remember, in the Catholic Church, it's not a symbol of Christ. It is the actual body of Christ. Transubstantiation has happened. The bread has become the actual body of Christ. The wine has become the actual blood of Christ. And then you take the Eucharist out, it's quite a large Eucharist, and you put it in this beautiful holder, gold stand, and like a starburst coming out from it. And the Eucharist goes in the center, and then the priest comes to the front of the altar and blesses people with the Eucharist, and then puts it on the altar. And then people come in and they kneel and they pray to the body of Christ. 
it's a very, very beautiful service. Anyone, Christian or otherwise, will be struck by the power of that liturgy. So I was doing benediction one day in a church and I was sitting next to the altar, the Eucharist was exposed, the incense was filling the church and the door opened and a woman came in. This woman was walk walking purposefully and she walked all the way up the aisle and I thought, well, she's going to kneel and pray because it's benediction, the body of Christ is here. She walked up the aisle, took a sharp right turn, didn't acknowledge the Eucharist at all, and went over to the statue of St. Anne. So in Catholic churches, we have lots of statues of different saints. And I was looking, thinking, has she not seen the Eucharist? She walked over to the statue of St. Anne and she blessed herself and she said, St. Anne, St. Anne, send me a man as quick as you can. <laughs> and then she blessed herself and walked straight back out. <laughs> and I, I, I wasn't familiar with that prayer. <laughs> St. Anne, St. Anne, send me a man as quick as you can. She was really speaking from the heart. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is interesting. So I'm, you know, now a priest in the Catholic Church. I'm administering to my flock, I'm listening deeply to what they need, and this lady needs a man, and St. Anne is going to sort her out. That was one example. Then there's another example where we would do a shift at the monastery door, where people would come in and they would ask for masses to be offered for particular causes. So usually if someone died, people would go to the church and they'd say, please say a mass for the repose of the soul of and then the priest would book the mass so people could come and it would become their service, their kind of memorial service, or for other, other reasons. And then um, they pay a donation and then the priest signs the card and gives it. And then people exchange these mass cards. So it's kind of a business model that whenever you book the service, you get a mass card to confirm I've paid the fee the service will be offered on this day, date and time. So usually masses were offered for people who died, but it could be offered for any cause. And I was manning the, the desk this day and a young man in his 20s came in and he said, Father, I need a mass, I need a mass, uh, I, need, I need the card. I said, of course, we'll, we'll get you the card. I said, what's it, what's it for, son? And he said, well, it's like this. I'm going on holiday with my girlfriend, my fiance, and her mother will only let her go on the holiday if I have a mass said that nothing happens when we're away together. And I need to bring the mass card to the mother to show when we're on holiday, there's a mass being offered that nothing happens between us when we're on holiday. So I was looking and I'm thinking, how does this work? The Holy Spirit's going on holiday with you <laughs> to make sure you two behave. And I thought, no. And he said, you don't understand, Father. I need that card. <laughs> he said, you know, this is, this is my fiance. We're just going away on a holiday. I love her. I respect her. But the only way we can go on holiday is if I have a mask card. So I thought, oh, this is difficult. You know, this is difficult. So, of course, I gave him the mass card and uh, I said, you know, I, I will, I will offer a service for you. I will wish for your happiness. I'm not praying the Holy Spirit goes on holiday with you, but to God, I trust you that you respect your fiance. I trust you respect her family to honor them. And he said, I, I will, I really will. And so he got his card, they went on holiday and afterwards they came back and said they had a wonderful holiday. But that was a strange kind of psychology, wasn't it? On the mum's part and on the guy's part, it was a strange kind of psychology that someone could buy a mass card as a kind of form of family planning, I guess, <laughs> or, 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 you know, some, some kind of intervention relationship. When I um, first gave a sermon, uh, I was very nervous and I was in a church and it was really packed and there were 
elderly couple sitting up the front of the church. So I've been given all the good advice, you know, keep it short. Um, but of course, on your first sermon, you put so much work in, you, know, you kind of want to go on a bit and you want to practice. So I was giving a sermon and then this guy in the front row stands up and walks out of church. And I thought, what have I said that's offended him? And uh, so I carried on, but I was a bit shaken by it. You know, I didn't want to offend anyone. I wanted it to be a good sermon, a useful sermon. So after mass, I went outside, as you do, to say good morning to everyone who's come for the mass. This woman, his wife, came up to me and said, Father, I'm really sorry. Uh, my husband walked out of the, the mass when you're giving your sermon. And I said, I'm really sorry. What did I say that offended him? And she said, oh, no, you didn't. He just sleepwalks. <laughs> <laughs> that really told me to keep it short. <laughs> um, so, I mean, today I've got more time to talk. So, uh, but, but yeah, I can, I can do, I can do a Dharma message in five minutes. Uh, that was the best lesson: sleepwalking. And then I, I went to visit another church, and uh, it was a country church, you know, in a rural area, and. It was Mother's Day, and I thought, oh, you know, I love my mom, and I really want to take part in this Mass, and I was thinking of her, and I thought, I wonder what his sermon will be. When I walked into the church, it was a very rural church. All the women sat on one side, all the men sat on the other side. So I was up on the altar doing the Mass um, with the priest, and uh, he was he was a big guy. He was a kind of very straight kind of country guy. And um, when it came to giving the sermon, he looked a little bit nervous. He looked a little bit lost. And uh, so he went up and um, said, uh, you know, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's, um, it's Mother's Day today. Uh, mm, it's Mother's Day today. So to the men, I have a message. And I've been thinking about how to say this to you because I really want you to get it. Mother's Day is very important. So my message is simple. Treat your wife like your best cow. <laughs> I sat listening. And I thought, did he really say that? <laughs> Men, treat your wife like your best cow. You, you know what I mean. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <laughs> and off he went. And that was it. That was the sermon. And I thought, I'm not sure I belong here. I, I don't think I can get up and give a sermon to men saying, treat you well. But what he meant was that, you know, for their prized cows, these men really looked after them. They fed them well. They sang to them. They stroked them. They, you know, they, they washed them. They, they were like adoring. And this priest was struggling to give a spiritual message on Mother's Day. I mean, he could have spoken about Mary, the mother of Christ. He could have spoken about, you name it, he could have spoken about his own mother. He could have spoken about the many women he's administered to, administered to as, as a priest. But that's what Catholicism came down to on that day. You know, men look after your wife like your best cow. And I thought, oh, I'm not sure about this. So I was okay with some of the more mystical aspects of Catholicism, you know, transubstantiation, which is when during the mass, the priest um, blesses the host, blesses the bread, and it becomes the body of Christ, blesses the wine, and it becomes the blood of Christ. At a spiritual mystical level, I was okay with that. I was also okay with confessional absolution that someone could come into the confessional, could confess their sins and the priest could absolve them. Because what I saw from that was that most things that were confessed were just human things. And relieving someone of the burden of those things was actually a real blessing. But when I was preparing kids for their first confession, I learned something that really surprised me. So we'd have these classes, catechism classes and prep classes for kids for their first confession. 
tell them what to say, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. This is, this is my first confession. And then confess to sin. The priest would give them absolution, tell them how many Hail Marys to say, they'd go out and say it, and then they get a lollipop because this was their first confession. <laughs> And this young lad went in, he'd been in my class, and I'd prepared him, and he went in for uh, his first confession, and the priest ran out the box and said, David, what have, what have you been saying to these kids? I said, just the usual stuff, you know, nothing, nothing special. I said, what's happened? He said, this, this little boy has come into confession, and he's confessed adultery. <laughs> he was seven. He confessed adultery and the priest was like, I don't think you have. He said, no, I have. I have I've committed adultery. I want absolution for adultery. And so I spoke to the boy and I said, what's going on? What, why have you confessed to adultery? You're seven. And he said, well, I was so worried about covering all the sins. I, I looked at a list and A was adultery. <laughs> and he thought in his life he had to confess all the sins. <laughs> he was working his way through a list. He didn't know what adultery was. He just started with the first one and thought, I'll work my way through. So I thought, mm, maybe I'm not so good at this. I prepared him for his first confession. I was confessing to, 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 to adultery. And I think in the end, what did for me, even though my time as a Franciscan was hugely important and I don't regret a single moment of it. I really don't. And I have profound respect for Catholic priests, brothers and nuns. But what did for me in the end was I could not reconcile um, some of the key teachings. They just were not compassionate in my view. So I'm talking about the Catholic Church's teachings on LGBTQ. Plus, I couldn't understand why in the New Testament, Jesus said nothing about this. And you might think if it was a mortal sin, he might have mentioned it. He mentioned lots of other things, but he never mentions it once. Only reference, tiny references in the Old Testament, pre-Jesus, in the Torah, the, the, the Jewish uh, spiritual book. So Jesus who came, to save everyone, listed many things that you mustn't do to go to the kingdom of God and never mentioned being gay, never mentioned LGBTQ+, but the church's teachings were that if you were LGBTQ+, you would go to hell. So I thought, well, Jesus didn't say so. I know, because I've read it many, 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 many times. He doesn't mention it. And I kind of think he might have mentioned it if it was going to send you to hell. <laughs> But also the treatment of women, what I saw was misogyny. I was struck by the poor clares who are the female order of Franciscans. They're an enclosed order. Because I was a Franciscan, I could go and visit them. And these were the most serene and beautiful and deeply spiritual women I've ever met. So I was trying to reconcile how can they find this inner peace in Catholicism but the teachings are so misogynistic. You know, if someone was experiencing domestic violence, they were told to put up with it because marriage was a sacred vow and they just had to put up with it. Mm -hmm. Issues like abortion, which I know are difficult issues, but I just couldn't find compassion in there. And fundamentally it was about respect. So I thought, well, I can't be a priest because I can't teach these things and I can't minister to, um, to my community is with this teaching. So I knew I didn't fit and I, and I, and I left. Um, but I left on good terms. And as I say, I don't regret a, a single moment. So for an empath and a spiritual um, seeker like me, um, the final discussion I had was with my spiritual director. He was a Jesuit priest called Father Michael Paul Gallagher. And he's a wonderful, he's deceased now, sadly, but he was a wonderful uh, writer. He was professor of literature at University College Dublin, as well as being a Jesuit priest. And he was my spiritual director. Because the arrangement in the Catholic Church is that you're in one order, but your spiritual direction comes from another order. So you can speak outside your community and get advice and guidance. 
And um, he, he took me aside. He'd been listening to me for several years and um, guiding me. And he took me aside one day and said, David, you don't belong here. Jesuit priest says to a Franciscan friar, you don't belong here. It was like a smack in the face. Because I was really earnest, really, you know, committed. I knew I didn't belong there, but that was a painful thing to accept. And he just looked me straight in the eyes and said, you don't belong here. And he gave me a book on Buddhism. So I was really confused and really shocked. And I'll admit, I felt a bit rejected. But then I quickly realized, Father Michael Paul Gallagher loves me. He really knows me and he loves me and he cares about me. And I put myself in his shoes for a moment and thought, how did he find the courage to say to me, you don't belong here? He wasn't rejecting me. He was saying the one thing I really, really needed to hear. And um, so I thanked him for that book. And um, I left the Franciscans and I uh, went to the UK and then started a, a new career and a new spiritual journey. So my first milestone on the journey to Jodo Shinshu was um, a Jesuit priest saying, I didn't belong here and go have a look at Buddhism. Then when I came to the UK, I was very lucky to meet some amazing Dharma teachers, both Zen and Tibetan. And I'll say a little bit more about the uh, Tibetan teacher in particular in, in, in part two. Um, but it was, it was really, really interesting to find that the more I studied of Buddhism, the more it made sense. And then the more I got involved in things at the temple, the more it made sense. And what I heard in terms of pastoral care was really compassionate. It absolutely resonated with my heart. It didn't matter what people said when they came in. It didn't matter how embarrassing it was. It didn't matter how foolish they'd been. They were met with deep compassion and practical care. And there were no mass cards. And there was no benediction. And there was no confession. But people left the temple freed from their burdens and a little more resilient. And the resilience point is important because um, love alone is not enough to help us get through life. Because life is really tough, really tough. And I don't mean being resilient to be desensitized, quite the opposite. Resilience for me means really feeling things. But what I found in Buddhism was many teachers who I felt could really see me, really feel me, really cared for me. And then they quickly moved to guidance. Here's my guidance for you. Here's a book I think you should read. Here's a practice I think you should do. Here's a retreat I think you should do. And there was always, of course, a strong feature in both Zen and Tibetan Buddhism of uh, Sazen, uh, sitting and sitting with your thoughts. So for me at that moment in time, that was a really, really helpful um, decompression from Catholicism. And uh, to find, find myself, look in the mirror to see clearly, but also to be surrounded by people who were really compassionate, not just for me, but for others I saw. In, in, in great need. So I'm, I'm conscious it's um, 10 o'clock and I've, I'm very lucky. I've got a second uh, session after the coffee break uh, with you. Um, so I'll, I'll finish on that thought and then uh, pick up when we, when we come back, if I may. Thank you so much for listening so far. Please